Welcome to What's Law Got To Do With It, presented by PwC, the podcast where we look to the past and present of our guests and what they think about your future. My name is Victoria O'Toole, and today with my colleague Yana Forage, we're joined by Jason Williams. Jason is the Head of Legal Operations here in PwC and has a wide range of legal experience within the banking and legal sectors. So the very first question, we're going to go back to the beginning. You've had an interesting journey into where you are now. Can you take us back to the very beginning and the very start of that path? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, as you mentioned, my career has been more of a journey um, or more of an adventure than a, perhaps a journey. I didn't set out um, on day one to do a particular thing um, or to have a particular goal. I knew that um, I didn't want to be in my hometown and I wanted a kind of a broad, I wanted a view of the world um, and having, I guess, grown up in a relatively small town felt that, you know, I needed to explore some more. So that's why I kind of took the route that I did. I went to university. Uh, I studied a subject which I was interested in from a, I guess, a, a, a pastoral um, standpoint, I, I enjoyed being creative. When I got to university and I was made to be creative on a budget, on time, on a schedule, um, I hated it. And so decided that I would leave that behind. I got on the train, came into London um, and walked into a recruitment agent and said, give me a job. They said, do what? I said, I don't know anything. And that's basically where it all started. Um, I did that. I walked into that agency on the Tuesday they called me on the Thursday. I started on the Monday. That was the beginning of my banking career. Um, so that first off meant that I went into uh, a, a large American bank. It was called Bankers Trust at the time. It was then brought out by Deutsche Bank. So 19 plus years of my career involved working in banking. I did a number of jobs in the early days, as all grads, associates do. Um, whereby I worked around a number of different departments, got to understand how banking works. And then after, I think, probably about five or so years, I was asked by somebody that I had built up a relationship with through the network of the people that I interacted with in the bank. And they asked me to come over and set up a new function within the legal fun- in, within the legal team. And I moved over, I did that, and I essentially set up the COO function within the Deutsche Bank legal function or legal team. And then um, from there, yeah, I basically built that team up, did a whole bunch of stuff with them, set up their um, negotiation function, their IT team, their law firm panels, um, all their recruitment processes, everything that was required to make a legal team in a bank work well. Um, And yeah, I spent many years doing that, which was very enjoyable. as you're aware, banking went through a bit of a rough patch uh, at the end of the sort of um, noughties. And at that point, I was quite sort of, I guess, disillusioned with the um, the bank I was at at the time. So I moved to another one, which now I say back is sounds interesting because I don't know why I did that. But I went to another bank and I also spent time digitalizing all of their contract portfolios and then moving stuff out to their India operations. Once I'd done that for a few years, I decided I definitely need to change and therefore came to PwC. So, and that's where I am now. So yeah, never did I think to myself, this is the plan that I want. I've always just gone with whatever is kind of the thing I want to do at the time. And that's been very successful for me. Were you intimidated to enter into the legal world coming from a banking background? And what were your kind of expectations? What did you think it would be like? Uh that's a great question. Actually, I'm usually one that does the intimidating. Um, so having if essentially grown up in a bank, um, you are taught that to be very forthright, to speak your mind. Um, what you've got to remember is banks in the 90s and the noughties um, were loud, disruptive, energetic places. These, This is where the sort of it was the period whereby most of the central markets where trading was activity was undertaken shifted from those markets where the guys had the jackets and kind of you know bought and sold and it changed it moved in-house to banks trading floors whereby trading was done on a 
on, on PCs, on Bloomberg terminals, on Reuters terminals, etc. And so that activity went from those markets into those banking organizations. And that's what, at, you know, 22, I was exposed to. So when I then got to the legal department, which was a lot more traditional in its, uh, uh, I guess, the way in which it behaved and conducted itself, I hadn't any of that law firm training. I'd been brought up on trading floors. So when I walked in there, I was shouting and, you know, buy and sell, not quite, but, you, you know, and I was getting involved in it. And if I had a, you know, if there was an issue, I'd come out of my office and I would call for the person across the room to come in and speak to me about the issue, um, which, you know, in those days, you used to have to send a memo to invite them to come to your office in three days. I wasn't going to do any of that. So um, oftentimes my more brash approach to the way in which I undertook work was at an odds to that of which was uh, a, a traditional legal team at the time. However, I guess in hindsight, those legal teams needed to change and adapt because actually the environment in which we were operating was moving from um, control and, um, I guess, policing from a legal perspective what our businesses did to becoming a risk advisor or a risk partner and actually saying, if you want to do that, then you can do it this way. But actually, we would recommend that you do it that way instead because it would have less risk exposure on our department, on the bank, on whatever. So the two th I probably became successful because the two things coincided at the same time. Those legal teams needed to change and I was a different type of person than they had had before. Um, that doesn't mean I didn't have a rough time and it doesn't mean that Often um, I would rub people up the wrong way, but we got there in the end. <laughs> Were there, can you tell us about any specific challenges that came from not coming the traditional law route? So I 100% I, I believe that the law as a profession is open to everybody, regardless of what background you come from, um, what you've studied, what your interests are how you want to execute it. There are core principles that you can deploy in a legal career, which come from many different types of backgrounds, cultures, experiences, education, etc. And I truly believe that the diversity that law has, needs, should have, depending on what point in time you're looking at it, um, is only made better or stronger or more robust and actually is the core principle of law because of its differences. Um, as I said, that that view didn't always gel well with people that I was interacting with. Uh, I found it very difficult that I wasn't as educated as some of the people that I was working with or were working for me. I also didn't oftentimes gel well because um, of the background of the people that I was working with who were from top tier law firms or the 1% at university, only went to Oxford or Cambridge, etc. But what I came to, to appreciate is that my influence in that space enabled that to open out. So I had a positive effect on that. And I had a positive effect on the people that I was working with who's, who had not come into contact with characters like myself. Um, but equally, they had a, a, an equal and um, a lasting impression on me. So because I felt that I wasn't as educated as everybody I was working with, I went and got my master's degree. I went and got my master's degree in psychology, um, whereas they obviously had their LLMs. Um, but that's how they helped me better myself and I realized that I could attain that level of education and I needed to have a broader, more structural education in order to be able to do my job more effectively. So I spent two years doing my master's, I got that, um, I absolutely enjoyed every, every second of doing it and I use it every single day in my career from the day I got it to right to today. I would love to ask you about that, master's in psychology. Hi. How do you find that you use that on the day to day? And when did did you always have an interest in that intersection between the law and the mind? So for me, um, 
psychology is a really interesting science in that it is something which we we all every single day in everything that we do we our minds the way in which cognition works impacts us we don't think about it because we're not conscious of it but when you study psychology you become conscious of it if you're conscious of the psychologies that are at play in a business context, in a legal context, in a work context, even in a home and interpersonal relationship context, if you're aware of it, then you can change it, adapt it, or apply it so that you can understand what's happening. So having a master's in psychology enabled me to be a better negotiator, for example, and it enabled me to be able to explain to people that I was training to become is to negotiators or derivative negotiators what some of the aspects they might want to focus on as part of their negotiation training or as part of their day-to-day -day work. And in fact, oftentimes I find that when I speak to um, junior staff now that are in negotiation, um, if they hit a roadblock or they're finding a particular counterpart they're dealing with difficult, talking to them about some of these psychological principles, you know, that just helps them unblock that. So um, again, I feel like my background and my experience, my education and the law absolutely inter intermingle or entwine with each other to be successful. Um, I also think that, you know, that more broadly, ultimately what legal is for me about, it's about bringing together powerful minds. It's about bringing together um, creative thinking. But it's doing that in a team environment. And by team, I don't necessarily mean large numbers of people all doing the same thing. It can be multidisciplinary teams, whereby you're working with a client internally or externally. You're working with other parts of that client's institution, different um, uh, places around that team. Or it could be yourself work as a, as a professional services consultant, working with a lawyer, working with a client. And actually, it's about bringing those teams together and how you can empower high-performing teams with legal elements as part of them is fascinating to me, but it is also, I think, key to the success of our industry. So since you've started here at PwC, like the legal operations team, it's, it's quadrupled, I think. Um, so how has that changed from the day you started versus today? So one of the things that I realized when... I first started in this role was that um, we did need to embrace that multidisciplinary um, element of of the way in which we do work. So we are not pure play, private practice, advisory lawyers, right? The majority of that of our team um, aren't qualified, um, but I don't feel that that precludes us from being part of the legal industry or having a legal career. And what I realized is what we need to do is apply the right skills and resources to the right jobs at the right time to get the right outcomes for our clients. And so one of the things that I wanted to change was to make sure that the team was much more integrated into the firm as a whole. Um, we had a much broader view of legal work end to end from, um, you know, from right from the idea of the uh, advice that's provided or the client problem that's presented right the way through to solving, monitoring, and then uh, ongoing maintenance of that. And so it was about bringing all those different elements together. And that enabled us to be successful, which enabled us to grow, which enabled us to become more, even more multidisciplinary. And so now we have advisory, delivery, operational technology, project management, data architecture, all of these things which make up a modern legal department that we have. And ultimately, I see this across the entire industry now. So I believe it, is, it was the right way to go and it still is the right way to go. So as a head of legal ops, what's your day to day? Most of my day to day is actually spent uh, probably on two aspects. So one is either working with clients, understanding what their challenges and problems are, helping them formulate um, solutions, helping them understand as well that the problem that they see is probably not the problem that they're experiencing and they need to investigate that further and challenge themselves around what really is going on. Um, and then the second part of it is building teams and making sure that our 
our, uh, you know, our team members um, are in the right places, doing the right things, are thinking about the ways in which they do what they do so that they're adding value and they're contributing to our clients, et cetera. So it's either client work or it's people work, if that's the right way of putting it. Victoria mentioned about the growth of um, legal ops. who said 47 to 200 since you joined in 2020. When you say that you've got that side that is massively focused on people, how in that sh- such a short space of time, how have you managed to keep on track of that many people and with the aim to continue to grow, how will you continue to keep on track? Do you know, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, and, the, and the honest and tr- truthful answer to that is, If you hire the right people with the right attitude who have a passion for what you want to do and you can explain the strategy, all of the rest, by and large, sorts itself out. Because I I truly believe that if I outline the big picture and then allow everybody to understand how they can contribute toward that big picture that I don't need to keep track of people. They want to and will will themselves towards that goal. And and that's the most important thing. One of the things I absolutely hated when I was a grad going into the bank that I went into was being micromanaged. Um, I I don't particularly like authority, um, which is why sometimes I'm maverick or a bit of a rebel. But it isn't that, it is that I can understand where it is that we want to get to. I can foresee the steps that are needed and I would like to get there. Um, You know, and that's not that I don't want to be challenged or I don't want to be accountable, but I want the freedom to be able to get to that goal. And I believe that every single one of you guys in the team should have that same experience. And if I can give you a a path to follow and just say, I'll see you at the end. That is a much more productive experience for me. And it's a much more productive experience for you. I think I completely agree. And I think for some people that seems like a big, it takes a lot of bravery because you've mentioned yourself having the confidence to say, be surrounded by people with LLMs and say, no, I'm going to do a master's in psychology. It takes a great deal of bravery and confidence. What would you say to someone that was entering into the career that maybe wasn't sure that sure of themselves or didn't have that confidence yet? What can they do to to make the most of those types of opportunities? So I've reflected on this a number of times actually. Um, I I have often found that when I'm at my worst is when I spend too much time worrying about what everybody else thinks of me rather than what I think of myself and I want to do. That doesn't mean that there haven't been occasions whereby I'm the wrong person in the wrong job at the wrong place at the wrong time. And ultimately, I probably need to change that situation. So at that point, I need to be somewhere else doing something else with somebody else. But ultimately... I think that I'm the type of person that that I, this is going to sound terrible, I know what's right and therefore I'm going to go off and do that. Um, but that isn't because I'm arrogant, that's because I'm confident through all of the experiences that I've had that the way to do it needs to be explored. And I might be wrong and I'm happy to be wrong and say I've done it wrong and therefore it needs to be done differently. But until I've done it, differently and been shown to be wrong nobody else knows i'm not wrong or i'm not right so therefore i'm going to go and try it that was quite a confusing long way of saying it (laughs) confidence in yourself execute what you know to be the right thing keep a center of i guess morality to what you're doing always ensure that what you're doing is for the benefit of others whether that's your client or that's your colleagues or your peers, never for yourself. If you do that, you will nine times out of 10 end up in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Uh, what would you, we have to mention, because it always comes up in conversation when it comes to big form PwC, when uh, versus the traditional legal path or the traditional law firm, 
how do you view the, lots of the conversation at the minute is about competition between the two? How do you view that and what do you think the future looks like for both sides, the traditional and legal service? Yeah. And this th- that question really goes back um, to me many years, like 15 odd years. So I, when I was in my in-house role um, as the COO for the legal in-house legal team, one of my jobs was to manage the uh, law firm panel process. And as part of that, I was responsible for um, setting the rates, agreeing the pricing, if you like, from a, a panel of the law firms that we worked with. It was clear when I was at in that role that as an as an organization as a bank we couldn't afford to keep paying the same amount of money that we were paying for all firms that were doing the work for us and yet year on year on year on year the prices kept going up and so it got to a point where we we had a decision we could either reduce the quality of the law firm that we were having on our panel to get the price at a lower rate or we could say to the existing lawyers panel firms that we were working with, you need to reduce your costs. We didn't think that we should receive lesser service for the same price. And so we really ultimately were left with going to the firms that we were working with and saying, you need to be more cost effective for us. And if you think this is in an environment where, you know, the original LIBOR, um, crisis occurred where the Lehman's brother crisis occurred the amount of money that banks and financial financial institutions were spending on lawyers was so astronomical you you can't even imagine the numbers of of pounds dollars euros that were being spent and it's just absolutely not sustainable and so we had to have that conversation and the amount of pushback that I got, the amount of challenge that I got, the amount of, um, you know, just constant barrage of, Jason, you don't understand. These are the prices we need to make sure. And initially my view of that was, oh my goodness, maybe I've gotten this wrong. Maybe challenging them and saying, hey, law firm, you need to be more cost effective. Is me making them go out of business or is is impacting their own ability to pay their own staff and to bring me on their own junior. So I spent a lot of time educating myself on how law firms make money um, and what, what the dynamic was. And it was very clear to me that they could make a lot less. They could make as much margin as they needed to make, but they could reduce down the cost by doing things in a different way. And by doing things in a different way, what I meant was not having an eight-year PQE senior associate do a first-level draft by not having um, not by not not deploying technology to increase the efficiency of what they were doing. Um, you know, these were the days when I we used to spend hours and hours and hours standing at photocopiers, copying off you know documents, and every single one of those photocopies cost us twenty-four pence. And I could not work out. I couldn't work out why I'm being charged twenty four pence for essentially something which cost a couple of pennies, right? So there were lots of different ways, and that's a really minute example. But other examples include being charged for an hour's worth of work when they would only perhaps do fifteen minutes worth of work because of the way the clock roundup worked. And again, it wasn't necessarily that those partners or those lawyers wanted to bill us in that way. But it was that their systems had already been built that that was the way it automatically worked. It would round up. And so we'd have to have a number of these conversations. So for me, having had gone through that process, having those conversations, getting that pushback, and it not really, we made huge gains, but we didn't make as many gains as we should have done. The only other way to be able to achieve that was for there to be a different type of supplier in the market. And that is where I believe the alternative legal service provider market has grown up from. Um, also, the law society brought in a different law firm um, set up. Um, and so you can now have a, a limited company instead of a private partnership as a law firm. And there's all of these different mechanisms grew up around that, which is, I think, great because I think it's diversified the way in which legal services are being executed in the market. 
And I believe it allows the magic circle or the top tier law firms to operate where they absolutely are the best. They provide the best level of advice and uh, opinion on a whole range of extremely cutting edge matters. And that's exactly what we want them to do. And for that, I'm prepared to pay a premium price. At the other end, I am not prepared to pay a premium price or have a top tier lawyer do that who is at the forefront of their industry. Where that work is more routinized, is more well established, there is case law which makes it much more predictable, therefore the risk level is much lower, and therefore I want the appropriate level of resource at the appropriate firm for the appropriate price, and everything in between. And so for me, it's about a diversification of the market into these different types of structures and delivery mechanisms and also technology and all the other things that come with it. So I think there's absolutely a place for the likes of a Magic Circle law firm, but I also think that there's definitely a place for the likes of PwC and any other provider who feels they can add value in the legal industry. I think that's a great way to say that idea of diversification rather than competition. Yeah. I wonder... What do you think is the next level when it comes to diversification with PwC? And we've seen this change. You obviously have the mind for seeing these opportunities within banking, within PwC. And um, what do you think the next changes are? So I think by and large, the legal market has achieved the diversification. Okay, So there are now multiple options for any buyer of legal services to choose from. What I think that is now the next step is that actually the buyers, so the in-house legal teams, the general counsels working in all of the um, institutions, the corporates, the financial services, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's now time for them to realize they can buy in a different way. And I think that's now where this, in a lot of ways, has turned 180 degrees and is now a case of the industry has changed, but the people who buy from the industry now need to appreciate or now need to be braver in the way in which they buy their legal services. So I think that in-house counsel now needs to change and it's their, the emphasis is now on them. To really look at the where they're spending their money, are they spending it in the right way and could they be spending it elsewhere with better value and getting a better result for them. And so I think that's the next step, which is ironic because having been a legal buyer at 15 years ago, I would not have said that it was on me to do something different. It was on them to provide something different to me. I now think that that shift has changed and actually we now need to sort of self-reflect in a different way. From your perspective, going from a legal buyer and now you're a legal supplier, do you think that that is totally framed how you, I suppose, formulate the service that we provide? Or do you think there are other things that have been brought into it? Or how do you see that process? So for me, the services that we provide are ones which, are, when I speak to my network, are the things I hear that, are needed in the industry. And I think it, it with always, it's always been the case that in any marketplace, you have supply and demand, right? There's no point putting out a supply if there's no demand for it. And so you've got to be attuned to what is the demand in the marketplace. And the legal industry is a marketplace, as we've just discussed. And so it's important to be in tune with what it is that is needed. Now, sometimes we find that our buyers or our clients don't always know what they need or they say they need one thing and maybe they need something slightly different. So they will say that they want resources, uh, minds, bodies, etc. And actually sometimes what they need is commoditization, templatization, juniorization or technology in order to deliver that. But it's about having a number of solutions on the table which can fit any number of different problems and being able to present them all so that they can be a clear choice decision can be made by the buyer as to how they want to solve their problem and in what way they want to solve it. So for me, my job is to provide a number of different solutions, but based upon what I see the demand in the market being. I'm going to ask you something a bit different. 
So you, for those that don't know, myself and Victoria are based in Belfast, I know when I sing, and uh, Jason is in London. What differences do you see in the legal markets across the UK and how has it been managing uh, different people within different parts of the UK? So throughout my career, I've worked with teams that have been based in a whole number of different um locations. In previous roles, I had teams in Birmingham, Jacksonville, Florida, Berlin in um, Germany, as well as a number of locations across Asia, um, Mumbai, um, Bangalore, Kolkata, etc., just to name a couple. So for me, and from a banking perspective, this isn't anything different or new. Um, we've had um, centers of resources if you want for want for better words um you know for the first one i set up was in 2006 so you know a long time ago now so for me to work across a distance whatever that distance is 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 not new is not different it's second nature um i think however it is still new in terms of if you look at again the legal industry i think it has um, it has moved to a nearshore offshore model in the house much quicker than it did in private practice, but I think private practice is moving in that direction. That's all very practical, though. I think the more important question is how do you make that work from a leadership perspective, and why is it important to have it right? And so it's really important for me. One of the things back in two thousand six, I was looking at is where are legal grads and therefore the lawyers and the paralegals of the future being educated? And actually, when you look at the centres at which law degrees are being completed and, and which are um, leading to employability outcomes for those students, we've got to be moving away from a London-centric perspective. And that's why I went to Birmingham. I set up a unit there when I was with that employer. Um, it is why I fully believe that Belfast is a fantastic location. And in fact, I worked with one of the banking clients based in Belfast to help them set up their Belfast unit when they first um, uh, decided to move on that. At the time, I was in my bank and I knew the COO, my peer, was in that bank. Um and she called me out and she said, Jason, we think we're going to go and do this. You've already done something similar in Birmingham. Would you help us out in Belfast? And I was over the moon to come and help. And so actually, again, from that perspective, I learned about the Belfast market. I learned about the amazing grads that Ulster and Queen's produce. Um, but also the fact that Belfast can attract grads from Liverpool and Wales and any other numbers of locations around the UK. And so for me, it's not just about the location, but it's also about access to the academic excellence that's being produced and that not necessarily meaning a forced move to London locations. I think that's a great. I, we so often hear um, the expectation that everyone goes to London and that that's where the, the if you're not in London, you're kind of missing out on things. So I think it's great to hear that there are centres all across the UK. We we're very fortunate with Peter. We see that the centres all across the UK where there's growth and development, and you know, I think I think it's a great thing again for diversifying the market. You get different perspectives and also different um, legal systems in the UK and land border with the EU here in Belfast. So yeah, no, definitely. I think we're kind of glad to have that opportunity. I think I'd like to ask you as well again because we're we're here in PwC. And myself and Victoria are legal associates, just starting our careers. Out. What advice do you have for us? So I get asked this question regularly because I do a lot of networking type events, etc. And really, I think um, the core advice is to is to build a knowledge base and includes in that knowledge base as a network. So. One of the things that I didn't do very well when I first graduated and started out was build a network. I went into my employer's organization um, and I was like head down and I just did my job and I did it um, 
very well. I did it amazingly well. I progressed very quickly within my organization because um, of the work that I was doing. But what I didn't do was spend time investing in my network because I didn't feel like I needed it because I was getting an acceleration from where I was based on the work that I did. But what I found out to my consequence was at some point that becomes limiting. And actually you need a network because, and not just a network to find the next job, but people in your network that you graduated with may become a client in the future. They may become, um, you know, a hugely successful academic and will have thought of the next thing that we'd never thought of. They may have invented AI, right? Um, and all of these people, they're like they're like patches on a quilt. They will add to the tapestry of your of your life and your career. Um, and it is so important to understand who it is that you come into contact with, and to understand how you can assist them and they can assist you in the future as you both move forward. Um, and so, one of the things that I did when I did realise that I hadn't done that was then thought right. I need to completely reverse that and I need to really invest time in giving back to the network that I was part of that people had put me into. So my network, me, me being able to grow my own network was probably something that I'd missed that opportunity. But I thought I've got to now spend time investing back into all of the people that have put me into their network, that have chosen me to be part of theirs. Um, and so that's why I do a number of the speaking things that I do. I go on campus to universities. Um, I follow up with people that have been worked, have worked in my team and I keep track of their careers and where I can help them, I absolutely do so. Um, and so I'm kind of paying it back, but the advice is you need to then invest in that yourselves so that you can benefit from the people like me that want to pay it back um, and help you steer your career whether that's in legal or not. I want to pivot slightly um, just by knowing that you were the person who asked us to do this podcast. Yeah. Why did you ask us to do it? Uh, th that's a great question. So part of it is I passionately believe in the legal industry and careers for all, like I said at the outset, right? Um, I also think, again, and I've mentioned this, I don't have all the answers and so I didn't want it to be me asking questions um, because that's, that's you know, if you like, I've, I've, I've had my journey, I've had my adventure. Um, and therefore, it was really important for me that somebody that had a completely new perspective that hadn't perhaps even thought of some of these things had these conversations and was able to articulate maybe what are the concerns of people like yourselves that are, that are coming into the industry brand new, maybe have a whole bunch of expectations that you don't know whether they're going to be realized or have a whole bunch of none, no expectations and they're being formed, you know, on a daily basis because of the interactions that you're having right now. Um, and so, yeah, it was really important to me that A, that we get these messages out, that B, this is a, this is a form of me paying it back having you guys do this because I think you will reach an audience that we wouldn't be able to ordinarily reach. And also I wanted to make sure that some of the concerns and, and, and also some of the excitement that you're experiencing can come through in what you're doing in these podcasts. Yeah, that's certainly ours. It's been such a cool experience. I think it's selfish though. Yeah, we've just yeah. enjoyed doing it for us. Yeah. And if anyone else listening is enjoying it as much as we are. Yeah. Great. I no, I do feel like I've learned so much over the past few months. Just feel like I'm an adult now. Brilliant. Okay, so I think like this is the most quite important and I suppose the most difficult question we've been asking everyone. Did you see yourself being where you are now when you were 18, 90, just starting out? And what advice would you have for yourself? So I, I saw myself 100% building something, having an influence, being engaged and involved in something I was passionate about. I just did, had no idea what that was. Um, you know, at 10, I was going to be in the horse guards. Uh, at 
15, I was going to be, well, I was going to be a landscape architect, uh, a gardener. Um, and then at 22, I was, I was, you know, working in a, a, a large international bank. So those things all so far removed from each other that I don't think anybody could con contemplate them being um, the case. However, what I will say is, um, whilst I probably will say that some of the decisions that I made along my career, I perhaps in hindsight would not make, but those dis those mistakes or decisions that I made, which maybe I consider to be incorrect, are part of how I got to where I got to. So I may not have got to here today if I hadn't have made that decision then. All of the decisions that I perhaps regret, however, are all ones in which I didn't take the initiative that I should have taken. And that again comes back to the the answer earlier about you know what is it you know what should you do and the answer should always be yourself so the decisions that i regret most are ones where i let somebody else's opinion of me for my decision about what i was going to do and that's that's not right i do i have to know do the landscape gardening skills ever come into play at pwc they maybe don't, but on the point of all skills happen. So I, I, I have learned a number of things from that. So I think it's always important to, no matter how linear your work seems or how academic it seems or, or how, you know, word based it seems, always be creative, right? The other thing is, um, all of us are more than the, more than the part that we bring to work every day. And it is really important to get to understand how people's minds work. It's really important to understand what they enjoy doing with their life. Um, and also that they are not just the person that arrives nine to five Monday to Friday. Um, because we all have fascinating backgrounds and we all have fascinating experiences as part of us. And it's important to know what they are and bring them to the table. I love that. Yeah, that's a great answer. Jason, I think we will finish it up there thank you so much for joining us and uh, really appreciate you taking the time Brent thank you 